Stop recording. Start recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, uh, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, if uh, you are somebody who pre-ordered the game and follows along with the source code, today is day 206. So you want to uh, unpack day 205 source code into a directory. That is the source code that I am starting with now. Uh, and that is the source code that you would want to start with if you want to follow along with me. So grab that out of the source code zip. And uh, yeah, and then you can uh, code along. So where we left things uh, the other day, I was kind of thinking, uh, we were talking about this a bit, uh, and uh, you know, where we left things the other day, I was talking about, well, we, we built this sort of debug stuff and we've got a little bit more stuff to do on it, but I kind of wanted a way um, to, to sort of show like, uh, I, I wanted a way to, uh, to sort of show entity data. And we made this little thing where we could pick entities, you know, with the mouse, we could kind of move over them. Uh, all of our weird, you know, our little torso person or the little hero and whatever, you know, else is going on. Um, so we got all that stuff and we wanted to be able to show like entity data. So maybe I could like select that entity and just see like what its state was because as we move into coding like game logic systems and stuff like that, uh, we're undoubtedly going to have a bunch of scenarios where we don't know why an entity is doing something, right? And we're going to want to like be able to inspect it, um, right? And so where we left off uh, yesterday was I kind of said, well, let's figure out a way uh, to sort of dump that entity data. And so what we, uh, what we did is I sort of put in what I kind of wanted um, to, to be like how that would look, right? I wanted to do something like this, right? Uh, where I sort of say, hey, debug, you know, begin the thing that we're talking about, output these values, uh, and then end, right? And I kind of wanted that to just be, you know, autom I, I, I wanted that to just be all we would have to type, and then all that stuff would come out uh, automatically in the debug UI system, and, you know, we wouldn't have to fuss with it or anything else uh, like that. Uh, and so there's a couple things that, uh, you know, we could do. Uh, regarding that, and I was trying to think of since this is Dev Streamathon, and we wanted to kind of maybe do something a little bit self-contained for that. I thought that maybe since people ask me about this all the time on Handmade Hero, like all, all, all the time, right? Um, about how to do like metaprogramming stuff, and uh, it's not really something we're going to get to in Handmade Hero much. I thought uh, I thought maybe what we do for the Dev Streamathon, since Handmade Hero tends to be a more code-heavy stream, and I don't want to give people the wrong impression. Uh, I figured we'd do a very code heavy thing and maybe I'll show you uh, how to make this process automated. So if you look and uh, you go in here to a handmade sim region, for example, uh, we have a thing uh, where we've got <clears throat> this sim entity and you can see looking at the sim entity, right? Uh, you can kind of see that it's got all of these things in it. It was This is our test entity, right, that we made uh, when we were kind of getting our simulation systems up and running and all that sort of stuff. And it's just got all this stuff in there. And in order to output it to the debug system, I have to type all this stuff in manually, right? And what that means is every time I change something in here, I have to go change it in here as well. And it's just kind of a pain, right? Uh, so what I thought I'd do is just show you if you didn't want to do that, how would I make a very simple uh, basic system that would add to C++ what the standards committee somehow in 30 years never managed to actually add, even though it's like the most obvious thing you would ever add to a programming language if you ever programmed a program in your life? Introspection. So if we wanted to introspect something, I'm just going to show you how to do that. I'll try to get it done in an hour. It's a bit of a big thing to, 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 uh, uh, to sort of uh, put out there, but I'll give it a shot. I know it's something people have asked about a lot, and so let's just do it. So in order to do that, what we're going to need is we're going to need a program that we can run um, that will sort of uh, you know take a look at our uh, at, at at our files here and output something we can use that looks kind of like this, right? And so that's you know we're going to need like a little utility, uh, and in order to make a little utility, that shouldn't be too much of, of a big deal. I'll just make a thing in here which is just going to be like. Um, uh, you know, um, you know, simple preprocessor or something like this, right? It's just going to be our little simple preprocessor.c. Uh, and again, this is something that you can just uh, feel free to use whatever you want for, because like I said, uh, on Handmade Hero, the proper, the engine, um, we don't use any libraries or anything like that. Uh, we write everything from scratch. Uh, but for this, you know, I, it does not matter. So I'm totally fine with you just using uh, anything you want to use here, right? So I'm going to just say, let's say you use just standard I.O. or whatever uh, to do file re read and write. 
um, because that way it'll work everywhere and we don't care about uh, learning how to do that. We already showed on Handmade Hero how to load files and whatever else, right? Uh, so using that, I'll show you how to build the rest of the stuff from scratch. Uh, and of course, if you want to do this entirely from scratch yourself, uh, you can always just instead use the file routines that we use in Handmade Hero uh, or something like that. Uh, but I don't really want to bother porting them out here uh, at, at, at the moment, right? Well, I mean, I guess now that I think about it, well, nah, I won't. I'll just do it this way. I always have this tendency to like go like, well, why not just not do it? Because we've got them already there. Forget about it. Let's write them this way. It'll be fine. I'll get over it. It doesn't matter. All right, anyway. Uh, so here we go uh, with a totally standard C program. So everyone's familiar with this, right? It's very, very straightforward. Uh, and if we want to use uh, their kind of weird uh, file system to load things, uh, that's actually pretty easy as well. All we have to do is just uh, open you know, a file handle uh, like you do in C. Here is our, our simple file, right? Whatever it is, we're going to F open it. Uh, assuming that we got it, we'll do something with it. And then when we're done with it, we'll close it, right? It's extremely trivial. That's how that works. It's not as nice as our file API where you just say read the whole file and you're done. Uh, but what are you going to do, right? And so for now, we'll just say we're going to load handmade sim region. Uh, which is the thing that we want to pre-process, right? And we'll load that in, um, uh, and we will go ahead and, uh, and, <clears throat> and parse it, right? Okay, uh, so if we wanted to do that, I uh, would prefer, again, to keep the library used to a minimum because, you know, again, if it were me, I would just, uh, you know, be writing on top of, of, of existing code, probably. Uh, so I'm going to keep this as sort of a, a separate thing, which works exactly like all the rest of the stuff uh, that we did in Handmade Hero, where it's just going to load the entire file, right? So I just want a read entire file into memory and null terminate, right? This is a pretty handy function. I always uh, have it in my libraries whenever I'm programming. Uh, and basically what this does, right, is you take the file name, and what it's designed to do is just open the entire file, read the entire file in, right, and, uh, and then add an null terminator at the end so that you know that the, the file ends with a zero, right? Because a lot of things in C, they like to, to have strings that are terminated with zeros. That's how you know where the end is, right? Uh, so here's the file contents. I'm going to lo load it up by saying read entire file into memory and null terminate. I'm going to pass in just handmade sim region dot h because that's the file that I want to parse right now. And then when I do this read entire file into memory null terminate, what I have to do is I have to figure out uh, the end. Like I have to figure out how big the file is, right? Uh, so I need a thing here where I could just say like what's the file size. And there's a pretty easy way to do that in C. It's a little wonky. It would be nice if it was, it was not as wonky. But what you can do is you can use a function called fseek, which moves uh, the, the cursor around the file. And you can say that you want to go uh, somewhere uh, relative to the end of the file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to seek to the end of the file. I can find out how big it is then uh, right, by just saying, hey, uh, C runtime library, tell me where you are in the file. Um, and that would actually just tell me uh, what the actual file size of the file is. Right. Then I can just seek back to the beginning, uh, and then I can I'll have the fi in, entire file. Right. Uh, so that's the entire file size. Uh, all I need to do now is load it. Um, so I can go ahead and uh, you know I should probably also do this. Right. Uh, so what I can do is just say all right I want to return this uh, this big like sort of chunk of memory that's just going to be the thing. So now I know the file size. I can just say all right um, the the result. Uh, right equals a malloc of that file size. So now I've got it. Uh, and then when I f read in, uh, I'm going to f read in uh, something of, uh, well, actually, f read takes the buffer first, uh, just just because it does. I'm going to f read in that file size, uh, and, uh, and that'll be the end of it, right? Uh, so that's what I need to do to read the entire file into memory. Uh, and let's just go ahead and, and check to see uh, how that goes. Uh, let's make sure that that actually makes some sense, right? Uh, so, okay, first thing I'm going to do is add it to our build.bat. Uh, so here we go. Uh, we already have a thing here uh, where we uh, com compile our test asset builder, right? Uh, and so what I'd like to do there is just go ahead and, and compile this, right? So rem, um, this is our simple preprocessor, just our example here. And so what I'm going to do is just go ahead and compile uh, simple preprocessor .cpp, OK? Uh, and now that will just, in theory, compile that for me. Uh, and it looks like it did just fine. Uh, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually step into it in the debugger and verify that it actually worked at all or did anything uh, that I wanted it to do, right? Uh, which would be a nice 
change. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna set it to operate in that directory where our code is, right, in handmade code, uh, so it can find the code, which of course, you know, it can find uh, that file that I want to parse. I'm gonna go ahead and step into it here. Uh, here we are, I'm gonna step in to read it, uh, uh, entire file into to, uh, memory and I'll terminate. Uh, you can see me opening the file. It got the file just fine, which is nice. Uh, let's see what it thinks the file size is. The file size is 3313, that's uh, 3316, that's a totally reasonable number of bytes for that file. Um, we're gonna fseek back to the beginning, right? And then we're going to malloc something of that size and fread into it. And let's see if uh, what we got uh, was the contents of the file. Um, there it is, right? That's the file, uh, sure, sure enough, right? Uh, and you can see at the end here, uh, it just kind of becomes garbage. The reason for that, of course, is that we have not actually uh, done the null termination part, but that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so that loads the entire file into memory. Again, really, really simple. Uh, so all I wanna do now is I wanna go ahead uh, and allocate a little bit more space, right? Just one more byte for that null terminator. And then after we do the read in, I'm just gonna say at the very end of the file, put that null terminator in. So now I've got a null terminated file, right? I got null terminated, the contents of the file null terminated. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna parse this thing, right? I wanna go through it and I wanna find uh, whatever it is in there that I wanna pull out. Now there's a problem with this. And the problem with this is that it could get pretty nasty in here, there could be lots of stuff, and I may not want it to pay attention to all these things, right? I may not want it to actually pay attention to something like move spec or entity type or whatever, or hit point. I may not want it to parse these structs. I may not want it to do anything with these. And so I need some way of annotating, right? <clears throat> what these guys are. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into handmade.h, uh, right? And up here in handmade.h, when we're talking, actually, uh, I could even put it in handmade platform. Um, well, yeah, I'll just put it here. Uh, at the top of handmade.h, uh, before anything else happens, I'm gonna define a little bit of markup. And what I do typically for this sort of thing is I just define some macros that compile away, right? So what I'll do is I'll define something such as, um, you know, uh, uh, introspection, right? Something like this, uh, I don't know, um, and, and params, some, I don't know, something like this, right? I'll just, something. And the key part here is that it doesn't expand to anything. It's a macro that just literally vanishes, right? And so then you can do something uh, like, okay, this struct right here, I want this struct to be like an introspected struct, right? Um, and maybe that's introspection is probably done, maybe just introspect, right? Uh, and I just say like, oh, the category for introspection, um, you know, is um, brown butter, right? Um, that's, I don't know why brown butter, because, you know, it's uh, tastier than regular, but I actually like regular butter. So, you know what, let's just say regular butter for now. Regular butter is pretty tasty. Uh, like you get a baguette and regular butter, it's pretty good. If the butter's good and the baguette is both good, like I can just say, I, I can see where the French are coming from on that, right? You know, I'm American, but still, you know, it's like I, I was never one of those people who called it freedom fries, I guess is my point. Uh, so anyway, uh, if I go ahead and compile Handmade Hero now, you'll notice this doesn't do anything, it doesn't create a problem for us. It basically just allows us to inject code uh, that's only for our preprocessor, and that's crucial. It's crucial to understand how important that is. That's the thing you, you definitely need uh, to, to know in order to start marking up that code. So we've got that in there now, we've got the file contents, and what we're gonna do now is we're going to start parsing the file. Now, in order to start parsing the file, uh, what you wanna do is you want to build a relatively traditional parser structure, and the way that that works is two, two phases, essentially. Uh, the first part of looking at the file involves what's called lexing. Uh, it means breaking up uh, the, the stream, instead of just being a bunch of individual characters, you try to agglomerate those characters into pieces that mean something a little bit more. And so, for example, uh, you might think about uh, the tokens in this right here as uh, being things like the, the, the lexicographical tokens, I, I should have said they're called tokens, um, that, that lexing process is about binding the letters I-N-T-R-O-S-P-E-C-T into an identifier token, like this is, or, or you know, like a, a set of words, right? Um, then I've got a parentheses token, right, which is grammatical. Then I've got a category token, then I've got a colon, then I've got a string, right, open quote, whatever. And so instead of just looking at this as just a big bag of characters, which can be a little bit daunting, we instead start looking at it as a bag of tokens and that will make it a little bit easier for us to parse. So the first thing we wanna do is make a thing that allows us to get tokens out of the file, right? 
So let's do that. Here we go. Uh, what we want to do is define something like a token structure. We want the token structure to tell us something about uh, where it was. So we prob probably want something like uh, what the text was, what the, you know, what the what the contents of the token was. We probably want us to say how long it was, right? Uh, so this is the length of the token, right? <clears throat> That's the region for it. Uh, and then we're probably going to have something like a token type, right? And that is uh, what kind of token this this thing was, right? And so one might be an identifier, like I said. Uh, we got other stuff in there, uh, right? We just got a, a bunch of things. Oops, that was not very good. Not a very good cut and paste job there, Mr. Muratori, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, so we're going to want things like, you know, okay, we've got an identifier, we've got a parenthesis, you know, open paren, um, we've got, uh, you know, colon, we've got string, we've got close paren, um, we've got semicolons in there, uh, we've got asterisks, we have, um, now, do we have anything else? We've got open brackets, right? Um, we've got uh, open braces, right? Things like this. Um, so we got something like this. We're going to want these tokens to come back and we're going to want them to look like that, right? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to start writing code that just looks like this. It's just like token, to you know, token equals get token, right? And then of course, I guess we should also have a uh, token end, like the end of the thing, right? Like end of file or whatever, end of stream, something like that, right? End of stream. Uh, and so what I want to do is something like, okay, uh, let's just do a for I loop. Uh, we'll go in here uh, and we'll keep grabbing tokens until we can't grab tokens anymore. Uh, so we'll do a switch on the token type right? And I should probably put an actual token type in there, right? Uh, we'll switch on the token type. Uh, we'll do a case where we say, okay, it's going to be one of these things, right? Like so. I guess we don't actually have to do a switch on the case quite yet. Uh, we should probably just keep things a little simple at first. Uh, we'll just say, okay, if it's the end of stream, we need to stop, right? Uh, we're going to be done. Should probably do something like this too, since we're inside a switch statement. Uh, so we've got a bool here that's like, you know, parsing equals true. And we'll just say, well, we're parsing. Uh, so then when we want to end the parsing, we can just say the parsing is done. It's over and we'll break out, right? So assuming that we're not hitting the end of the stream, then what I want to do is I want to say what we actually found. Uh, so I'll just do a thing where I say like, you know, what the token type was maybe, and then what the string uh, was that was there. Now, one of the weird things about strings, uh, I don't remember, there's a crazy syntax you can do uh, to print out length strings. I can't remember, you specify the width of the thing and you specify an indirect width specifier. It's like the craziest thing ever, uh, but you can do it. Uh, printf indirect width specification. <laughs> Trust me, this is a real thing. Um, it's kind of absurd. Uh, I just want the actual def, here it is. There it is, that's it right there actually. You can see it's that star, right? Uh, the width specification, uh, an int argument from the argument specifies the value, right? Uh, so you can actually do this with strings where you're actually specifying the width to print out. Uh, and the reason I care about this, right, is because our tokens are specified as a length and a pointer. So I can't just pass, right, I can't just pass this because uh, by default printf will read until the null terminator. Of course, I should probably pass that as well. We'll just read till the null terminator that string and it'll just go off into no man's land and crash or who knows what it'll do, right? Print it'll just print garbage until it hits a zero by luck, whatever. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to specify an int there. I want to be able to specify that text length, right? I want something more like that. Uh, and so I forget if I have to specify a dot for that um, uh, or not. So we'll find out here. Uh, let's see, printf string indirect string width. It's something like that. Um, and it's it's just kind of crazy. I, we could probably just sort of muddle through it as well, but uh, I'll try just percent star s for now. But I think you might have to put percent dot star s. Uh, it, this is the vagaries of, of C. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I don't use this. I don't really use printf uh, anymore. So it's, it's, uh, it's not something that I have kind of at the, you know, at the top of my um, of my brain stack of things uh, of things to do. Uh, so let's see here. You can single byte characters wait up to the first number until the precision value. So there it is, right? So it's width.precision, 
right, is usually, it's like with dot precision is the way it goes. So we do need that dot in there to say, it's the precision value we're specifying. We're specifying it with a star. So read it off the stream and it's a string. Uh, crazy town, C++ printf crazy town. Welcome to it. Okay, uh, so that's how we're gonna do our little printout thing. Everything should be working here, except for the fact uh, that we don't have a get token thing. And so what I wanna do here is I want to have a thing like called a tokenizer or something to store the state of this just so we know where we're at, uh, something like this, right? Uh, it might store some other things later, I don't know, uh, but I just want a thing that we pass around for state. So what we're gonna do is say that we have a tokenizer. Uh, the tokenizer is, is just gonna be initialized uh, to have just that at pointer pointing at our file contents, like so. And then we're gonna say, go ahead, get a token um, from this tokenizer thingy that I've created, and uh, that get token <clears throat> is just expected uh, to do whatever it needs to do, right? Okay, uh, so here we go. How do we actually do that? Uh, well, at first of all, uh, we probably want to do some basic things that tokenizers, uh, or, and I guess this is technically lexing, I guess at this point, right? We want to do something that, that lexers typically do. Uh, we want to eat up any uh, white space because typically in programming languages like the one we're using here, white space just does not matter, right? Uh, so what we want to do is do something like, um, <clears throat> you know, eat all white space or something like this. Uh, where we just say like before we do anything else get rid of any white space that's in there because we just simply don't want it right and so here's the our eat all white space uh, we have our tokenizer um, and uh, what we will simply do is go okay uh, while the tokenizer at um, you know while this 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 app uh, thing while we look at what it is equal to and what it's equal to you know is white space so we can do that pretty easily in fact we could even make a little query for it like this uh, we could say while that's white space we want to go ahead and advance it right so we're just literally moving past any white space that's in there again really trivial probably um, for anyone to write as well uh, that is white space function uh, pretty uh, straightforward that just takes uh, some care whatever it is right uh, I'll guess we'll call it C and it just is going to return uh, this result and that C equals uh, basically any of the white space stuff uh, that we know of right so if it's that if it's a space um, if it's a tab or something like this uh, if it's a new line right uh, then we want uh, uh, to to say that it's white space right uh, so that's it. So while that's uh, happening, we're going to advance by the white space. Then what we're going to do is take a look at see what character we're actually on. And then we're going to do something uh, with that character, right? Uh, and so let's just see what all the stuff is that I said we were going to parse. And let's grab it like so. And so I'll just say, okay, uh, if the token is an identifier. Oh, <laughs> that's... That's great. We don't know that yet. That's not what I want to do at all. Uh, we want a way to determine. Yeah. All right. Brain. Getting a little brained. It's true. Uh, in order to figure out if something's an identifier, that's going to be a bit of a catch-all because that's like anything could really be an identifier. So really what we want to do is focus on these guys first, right? Uh, if we see an open paren, uh, we pretty much know what we're dealing with here, right? Um, our token dot type uh, equals an open paren uh, and we're done, right? So I think basically, you know, these guys are, should be really, really straightforward. In fact, I could even, I could probably compress this down to something really straightforward, something that looks like this, right? Uh, and so here's the other ones we've got here. Uh, we've got close paren, that's gonna be this guy. Uh, we've got semicolon, that's gonna be this dude right here, right? Uh, we've got asterisk, that's gonna be this guy. Yeah, uh, we've got open bracket. Right, oop, that was not where that goes. Not where that goes, not at all. Uh, so open uh, bracket, close bracket. I don't know why those braces got, got plurals on them. They were a little bit too, too ready to go. Should be only open brace. All right, uh, open brace, close brace. So there's that code, right? So that would just determine what we were looking at when we're looking at something relatively straightforward. Uh, I forgot the colon one there. So there we go, colon, okay. Uh, so that's 
you know, all we really need for all of these guys, but then we've got the string and the identifier one. And in fact, you know what I'll do is I'll move those guys down here so we can kind of see like, you know, here's our, our string, you know, here's our, our sort of um, uh, our simple guys versus complex guys, right? Uh, and similarly, at the end, we also kind of know, uh, in fact, we could even do it here where we say, you know, if, uh, if we see the null terminator, right, um, as part of the character as well, uh, that's going to be token um, uh, end of stream, right? Uh, so yeah, so all we need to do here is just assume uh, that our result token, right, let's just assume that the result tokens text length is one, and we'll assume that the tokens text is where we are at. And that will just make it so that all of these, this, this, the multiplicity of cases here is just a, a trivial assignment of the type, and then we return and we're done, right? And so then all we have to do is start implementing these more complicated cases here. Uh, like let's say we see um, uh, one of these um, quotes, right? Or something like that. Uh, or let's say we get some other thing here uh, and we're gonna treat it as an identifier, right? Okay, uh, so what we wanna do now is we wanna say, okay, if we get a string, we just wanna read through the entire string till we get to the next uh, like quote, right? That's all we really want uh, to be able to do. So in order to do that, all we would say is, okay, you know, while you know, uh, we're just gonna advance the tokenizer, we're just gonna say, okay, skip over uh, that quote because we don't want the quote to actually come out in the string value, right? So skip over that quote, and then uh, let's say that the token's text uh, is equal to where we're at now. Uh, then we just wanna keep going until we see a close quote. So we basically wanna say, you know, while tokenizer at uh, is not um, equal to a closing quote, uh, and we also wanna make sure uh, that it's not the null terminator because we might hit the end, it might just be an invalid you know, program or whatever. While these are happening, uh, we just want to keep, you know, we want to keep advancing. So in here, we want to do, um, you know, a simple advance like that. Now, since this is C and C allows you to uh, escape with a backslash, things like the quote inside a string, we probably also want to just do a little bit something extra here and say that if the tokenizer at happens to be a backspace, like it just happens to be, right? Uh, then we will actually advance the tokenizer past the next character, whatever it is, right? Uh, so we'd say something like, if the tokenizer at uh, zero equals uh, the backslash and uh, you know the tokenizer at one, the next character is not equal to the null terminator, so that it's not like the end of the stream, uh, then at that point, we'll just say skip, skip two characters, right? Otherwise, we only skip one. And so that allows us to keep uh, parity with C. So if there's quotes and strings, if someone quoted out, uh, 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 if someone back quoted a, quota a double quotation, we won't end the string prematurely and fall out of phase with the C uh, way of parsing things, right? So, okay, so we've got that. Uh, and now we just need a way to parse identifiers, right? And so inside our processing for identifiers, uh, you know, we've got this default case. We pretty much got two things we might wanna look at, right? One is, is this thing alphanumeric, right? Uh, so, so basically, is this thing, um, like, is it, an, is it an alphabetical character, I guess what I'm saying. So is alphabetical. If it is, then it could be the start of an identifier, right? Um, and so whatever the tokenizer at value is, <clears throat> excuse me, if that's alphabetical, uh, then I want to parse an identifier here, right? Um, otherwise, if it's a number, right, uh, or is, is numeric, I should say, something like that, um, then we might want to parse a number, right? Okay, uh, and that's really all we would need to do here. We haven't implemented those yet, so we're gonna have to think about those, but there's one other thing we need to do here, which is uh, if we end up in a case where we see a slash, we have a little more work to do, right? Because there's comments in C code and we want to bypass the comments. So we actually also have one more thing that has nothing to do with returning a token. It's just about skipping over dead space, right? Um, and for that matter, we could put that in the white space eater uh, as well, right? So in the thing that does eat all white, white space, oh, <laughs> how far were you guys gonna let me get in that? I can't really blame you because I'm not looking at the chat. <laughs> in the thing that does eat all white space, uh, we also might wanna do um, sucking up of comments because comments are basically considered white space and we don't want them, right? 
Uh, so while the thing is white space, right, uh, we want to advance, but actually probably what we want to do here is something a little more uh, sort of broad where we do something like, okay, keep going uh, for a while. If it's white space, right, uh, then we skip over it. Else, uh, if it's uh, one of these guys, right, let's say it's that, uh, then we want to potentially parse a comment, right? So we would do something like, okay, uh, like this, Right, so that's gonna be a comment, right? That's gonna be a C style comment, parse C style comment. Uh, and furthermore, we also have the same situation happen here uh, where we might have something that opens, uh, I'm sorry, that pass was a C++ style comment. I, I misspoke. Uh, and here is the C style comment, right? Something like that. Okay. Um, so assuming that none of those is true, uh, then we're done. No more white space to be eaten, right? So now we've got our work cut out for us. We've got all the stuff in there for the most part. Um, for some reason, I insist on typing tokenizer dot even though it's tokenizer arrow. I will rectify that with a little search and replace and done. Uh, and then we just have a bunch of things here uh, that aren't actually implemented yet, right? Uh, so let's do parse the C style comment. Uh, all, all that needs to do, right, is it just needs to go until it sees uh, star slash. So we can assume in here, I guess we'll just say that the tokenizer uh, at, right, uh, we just skip over, uh, in, in either case, we skip over that part, right? Uh, and uh, I think actually, now that I think about it, uh, we can probably, we, I don't even know why I bothered putting these in here. Uh, they're pretty straightforward, so I wonder if maybe I should just write them in line, right? All that, all that they actually do um, is, you know, uh, while uh, tokenizer uh, at, um, you know, is not equal to n uh, and tokenizer at is not equal to r. So while it's not a, an end of line, right? Uh, and I could actually do something too, even here, that's like uh, is end of line kind of a thing. Uh, I could just even have a function that tells me that, right? Um, and uh, something like that, right? That makes sense? So yeah, if I want to do something like that, I can just do like while uh, not is end of line on the tokenizer at zero. Uh, let's just go ahead and advance. Right, so that just eats everything uh, till the end of the line, uh, and uh, of course I also again want to check to make sure we're not null. So you know, while there is a character to read and it's not the end of the line, uh, then keep going and just eat it, eat it all up. Right. Uh, the same exact thing will happen here, right? Uh, and uh, and that's like after we skip over this guy, we just keep going and say, okay, uh, while we do not hit. Um, <clears throat> sort of the, the, the stop, the, the, uh, the, the closing part, right? Uh, so while we don't hit um, basically this guy, does that make sense? So we're basically saying, while there's a character to read and um, the, uh, I should say this way, uh, while, uh, nah, this is a little Boolean logic for you there, while that whole thing is not true, right? Uh, while the, uh, the star uh, slash is not exactly what comes next, right? Uh, then we can advance ahead, right? When we break out of that, if the thing that we're looking at uh, is the star, right? Uh, then we are going to want to advance past it uh, because that means that we didn't run out of characters and we want to skip the star and the slash, which we ended on, right? Okay. Uh, so that's really it for those guys. Now we just have a few more. Um, oh, we got to fix the, uh, the errant plural there. Now we just have to do our sort of uh, more complicated parsing here uh, where we're going to sort of try to pull out these other sorts of things. So we've got uh, two things. We've got is alpha. So we want something that tells us 
whether this is an alphabetical character, we also want something that's going to tell us, you know, is it numeric? Is it going to be a new number thing? Uh, and for right now, I think we can probably just, just use false for that uh, because we'll get to that maybe a little bit uh, later on, right? Um, how exactly we'd want to do that, right? So this is, you know, to do Casey, uh, once we do numbers, do this, right? Um, although I suppose, you know, we can probably guess if we wanted to. Uh, that's like, you know, if C is greater than or equal to zero and C is less than or equal to nine, then it's a digit, right? If that makes sense. Uh, and there's probably like a dot that would also be another one um, in there and like the F and an OX, right? So there's probably some things, but for now we'll just use that one and we'll, we'll go a little bit further when we need, when we actually need to, right? Is alpha is really simple. Uh, that's just going to check to see whether we're in the alphabetic range uh, of the ASCII character set, right? Uh, so here is that. Um, that's for lowercase, uh, and we can do that um, or uppercase. Okay. Uh, so that you know, test those two, right? That's whether or not it's alphanumeric. Uh, <clears throat> we can now get that sort of information back, and so we just need now to be able to do the two parses. Uh, parse number, uh, we don't really need yet because we don't uh, care about that. Uh, so really what we could do here is just sort of, like I said, wait a second on this one uh, and we'll kind of look at that one a little bit later when we actually care about it. Uh, so for now, all we'll do is when we get to a default thing, uh, we'll probably just say like, okay, uh, we don't know what this token actually was. So maybe we just say at that point, we throw it out, right? Uh, so we just say like, okay, uh, this token dot type equals token unknown or something like that. Right, so there's just some kind of thing like this token unknown. Okay, uh, and what we'll do here is we'll also say that you know in the case where the token is unknown, right, uh, we could also do something where we uh, <clears throat> skip those, right? So we won't print those out. We'll only print tokens that we know for now. So that seems hopefully pretty basic. Uh, all that seems good. Parse identifier actually. Now that I think about it. It's really not that complicated either. Um, I mean, all we really have to do is say, okay, the token starts where it, where it started, um, and so we just need to do the lengths. We should also do that for our string, by the way. Uh, here at the end of our string, when we do all of our, our string parsing, we picked up what the string text was, right? Uh, but we need to, to set the length, which we didn't do, uh, and we also need to set the type, right, which is the token string. So we need to say that it's a string, uh, and then we also need to set uh, the end of it, right? So at the end of all of this, once the thing has gotten to the end, what we want to do is say, okay, um, at this point we should be sitting on the actual, you know, the actual stopping point. So we should be able to say whatever the distance is between the at function, right, um, and uh, whatever that place we started uh, and where we uh, began, right, which we saved. Uh, sorry. The place that we're at now and the place that we began, if we subtract the two of them, we should get the length of the token, right? So with the first part of the string, the first character in the string, we know where that was, that's token text. The last character in the string, we're sitting on it now, right? And it's that uh, closing quote. So we subtract those two, we'll, we're done. Uh, but what we also want to do is skip that closing quote um, because we're still sitting on it, right? Uh, so assuming that we actually found the closing quote and it's not that we hit the null terminator and like, you know, it was an unclosed string or something, assuming we hit that closing quote, uh, then we want to skip the closing quote. Make sense? Okay. Um, so that's really pretty basic. Uh, and again, this stuff, I could, I guess I'll expand this to technically be a size T, although we're never going to be parsing files that are that big. Uh, I'll say it's a size T for now. There you go. Okay. Uh, so parse identifier. Oops. That's, that's a mistake. Thank you, compiler, for catching that. Um, so for parsing this guy, uh, an identifier is just a collection of, uh, of alpha and no numeric things plus the ability to have an underscore. So really all we're going to do here for this is we're just going to say um, while tokenizer at zero, you know, while that, whatever that is, uh, is alpha uh, or it could be um, is uh, numeric uh, or it's an underscore, right? And I think I'm going to say is number because now we're actually using that uh, for reals, right? Uh, so I think I actually want to call this is number because that's a little clearer. 
Uh, then that's the things we can put in identifiers uh, in our code. That's all the things we ever use for them. Uh, so while that's the case, we'll go ahead and advance the tokenizer at. At the end of this, again, uh, we will just have uh, that tokenizer at uh, be specifying the length this way. So it's wherever it started uh, versus where it ended. So I think that's everything. Um, at the end, we return the token that we got and we continue, right? Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. So let's see what we've got here. Let's go ahead and step through this. We probably have a bunch of bugs. That's a lot of code to type in at once. Uh, like I said, I went pretty fast because I wanted to kind of compress it down. Uh, just because it's something that we're kind of doing a, a weird stream, uh, not like we normally do. But anyway, here is our, our tokenizer in action, uh, our lexer basically, the first part of, a, of the tokenizing. Uh, so here we are looking at this stuff. Uh, so we're gonna have some things we don't understand like that pound, uh, we don't know what that is. Uh, so we should go in here and, and get an unknown token, which we did. Um, let's see now, this token should be an identifier basically. Uh, we're gonna go in here to eat all white space. Uh, we're gonna look at this thing and it's none of these, right? So we're gonna exit out of there. We're gonna start by assuming that we have a token uh, length of one. Here's the token text, right? Um, which starts on that pound. Oh, aha, we do have a bug already. Token unknown, when it sets that needs to skip over right these guys need to skip over uh, the token at so none of these guys i guess that's sort of the thing these guys don't skip over that first that first guy right uh, and that's a that's a problem so how do we want to deal with that right um how do we want to how do we want to make it so that these can be convenient you know because i can do this uh, but it seems a little bit annoying for me to kind of have to do it uh, every time like that. I don't know. Doesn't that seem like kind of a pain? Maybe it's not a pain. Um, but for these hand-coded guys, you know, I mean, you could always back it up. I suppose we could do something ridiculous, right? We could do something like this where we say, you know, by default, go, go past it or something like this. Uh, so we do like care uh, C equals tokenizer at. Uh, this could be a real bad idea, uh, but we could do something like that so that all of these work. Uh, and then this guy, of course, this would just work because he already wanted to advance by the quote, so that's fine. Uh, so it's really this guy who needs to know what's going on here, right? Uh, so this guy says something like, all right, assuming that C was alpha, right? Uh, then we're gonna run through these guys. Uh, while it's still there, we're, you know, we're gonna kind of add to it. And I think the rest of this sort of works. Uh, so let's let's just see uh, how that goes, right? Okay. Um, so let's see what we get here. Uh, let's get back our first token. There's our token. Uh, it's a token unknown. It's one length of one. It's that pound right there, which is what we expect. Uh, so that's good. Uh, let's now see what the next token is. Uh, the next token is, is token uh, of length two, uh, but that's specified as unknown as well. I think that's just because, again, uh, that was just me forgetting. In here, we've got to set the token type, right? Uh, to token identifier, but that should have uh, that should have parsed okay, right? And in fact, I should probably do that like right at the top when we do them for the most part, just so I can see that I actually did it there. Okay. All right. Um, so there we go. There is our token unknown. Now we should get a token identifier, uh, and hey, we did. It's text length two, so we're going to print it out um, to the console. And there's the uh, output right from it. I, oh well, actually, no, the output's over here because it's a console app. So there's an 11, there was our if. Um, and so as we run, I think we'll probably be okay. So I can probably just actually run this guy uh, on handmade code now and actually get it to, uh, to work, right? So there it is, right? And you can already see that just from this, you can see that we're kind of already parsing what we need to parse, right? Do you see how this is already kind of lined up into what we need, right? I mean, you saw how simple that was what I just typed in, and now we've got a, a really straightforward kind of assist situation here uh, for being able to pull these guys out, right? So we're starting, we're starting to get there. How much time we got left? We have 15 minutes left. I don't know if we'll quite make it in time, uh, but we'll see, all right? So let's start by trying to identify that part uh, that we actually wanted to grab there. So as we're doing this, this uh, tokenizing, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead into handmade um, sim region here and take a look. That is the key that we're looking for. We're looking for this introspect and we wanna go ahead and grab that out, right? So what I wanna do here is go, okay, if I hit a token identifier, okay? So I've, I've, I've seen an identifier. 
what I want to do is I want to know, is the identifier introspect, right? So I want to do is say, if token equals something like this, right, introspect, something like this, then I want to parse uh, an introspection, right? Uh, you know, or introspectable, something like that, right? So I'm going to parse an introspectable. I need to pass the tokenizer to it. Uh, and that's how we know we're going to start parsing one of these special structures, uh, something that, uh, you know, has been marked up specially for us. So we know that it's something that we want to use in, in our, you know, in our pre-pass or whatever, right? So there's the tokenizing uh, that's going to happen there. And, uh, and what I'll do is I'll just suppress this uh, printf for the default now. And what I'll do here is I'll just printf uh, our introspectable uh, at this point, right? We'll, we'll, start, we'll start in there. Uh, okay, so what I need, first of all, is I need that token equals uh, to be a thing, because we haven't written that yet. Uh, and so here what I want to do is I want to make an inline uh, that returns a bool. And what it does is it takes whatever the token is, you know, whatever that token was, uh, and then it takes a care star that's like, uh, you know, the, the string, the match, and it just sees whether or not it matches, right? And so what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, I know that the token is a certain length, right? I know that it's text length long. So I'm going to go through and say, okay, uh, from zero um, to token length, like so, I want to make sure uh, that match uh, of that index and token text of that index, I want to make sure they're equal, right? So if they're not equal, it's over. It's false, right? Make sense? Uh, and similarly, uh, I want to make sure uh, that if the match index, right? I should actually say also here, just do this up first. So if the match of index, if that equals zero, so it's the null, right? The null terminator, that kind of thing, right? It's just zero. Uh, if the match index is zero, or they don't match, then return false. Otherwise, uh, the result of this function is just going to be whether, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to need this in index, aren't I? Hmm, is going to be whether or not we got to the end of match. So I'm going to need something. Well, you know what I can do? Let's just do this, right? Uh, so as we go through this, we just say, okay, um, if, you know, star at, star at, something like that, right? Uh, then advance them. In fact, I can even put that right in here. So just run along match, check it against the thing. When we get to the end, if star at uh, happens to be equal to the null terminator, we know we got, they both ended at the same time. Uh, and so we know that we can uh, say that, that it was actually uh, true. Otherwise, uh, it's false. So that's just a little like string compare thing that we have there. Um, and uh, we can go ahead and test it. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and come down here, right? Uh, and so let's go ahead and see what happens uh, if I step in here. Now, the token itself right, is obviously going to be equal to something totally not that. It's like if, right? And so our at is pointing at the beginning here. Uh, we go to through the index. The index is zero. Uh, these two won't match, so we should return uh, or not. Oh, it is because it's an I. <laughs> All right, so actually they will match on the first one. Then they won't match on the second one, and it should return false. So off it goes. Uh, but then eventually we should get to one that returns true if we've done it correctly. Uh, but I don't know if we actually did. It doesn't look like we did because we never actually got to a token uh, that equals that. So uh, now we got to go and actually see. Uh, let's double check here. Uh, when we get to a token, uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll say if I just want to be able to debug this code. If token text zero equals I. And token text one equals n, right? Something like this. And so this way I can just, I'll only have to look at the ones that actually have something related to introspect. Uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, go from there. Okay. 
So here we go. Let's see if we've gotten to a token that's relevant. There it is. That's the token we want. So we hit get into token equals. Uh, we take a look at what's happening with our matching. Uh, so now let's see where we're at in at and where we are in index is zero. So we advance through these guys. Um, we're advancing through as we would expect, right? And what happened there? What is the token length? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But the yeah, and the token length is ten. But our star at what happened there? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's just a typo. Well, we almost did it right. We almost did it right. That's pretty funny. All right, there we go. Uh, so now hopefully we're back in business. There we go. Uh, so here we are parsing under respectable. So now all we have to do is actually do uh, some gathering of the stuff from there. And let's see if we can do that, right? Okay. Uh, so what we want to do in parse introspectable is we want to just like read out exactly what this thing is, right? So we know that we've gotten a token for introspect. So now what we want to do is we want to basically like get the parenthetical phrase there. Um, so I'm going to kind of do this very straightforwardly because, again, we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to do sort of the base version. And then maybe Monday, since if people found this useful or interesting, uh, I'll show how to do it a little bit better, right? Um, but it would look something like this, right? Uh, you know, something like uh, if uh, require token, uh, tokenizer, uh, token open per, uh, paren, right? Something like that. Uh, then what we'd want to do is just kind of, I guess I don't care about this very much, but what we, well, yeah, let's just do it, right? Uh, then we do something like, okay, we do parse, um, uh, parse uh, introspection params, something like that, right? Uh, and we could almost even do this where we didn't actually have to do that, but, uh, you know, we should do it anyway, right? Uh, and here, you know, we do something like a printf, you know, uh, F printf to standard error, we'd say something like error, um, missing parentheses, right? Uh, and we'd, we'd want to kind of do a better error reporting scheme. It's kind of what I say, I'm doing the, I'm doing the sort of bare minimum thing here uh, rather than anything fancy. So, okay, we require the token, we do parse introspection params, assuming that we actually get those out, right? Uh, then we would do something where we go, okay, token, token equals get token. Uh, this is probably like struct token, right? Uh, so we go, or, or, you know, type token, like what's the thing we're going to do? Uh, let's see. So we do get token on the tokenizer, right? If token equals, you know, struct, uh, then we know we're parsing a struct. So we do like parse struct. Uh, otherwise, we do an error. Uh, introspection is only supported or a structs right now, sad face, right? Something like this. Um, okay, so if we do that, we need these two things, right? Uh, we need static void parse introspection params, uh, and there's our tokenizer. And all I'm gonna do there is I'm just gonna do like token, I'm just gonna have this eat everything for now, right? Uh, and so I'm just gonna do token equals get token. And I'm gonna say like, uh, you know, if, token dot type equals token close uh, paren, uh, right? Uh, or token type equals token end of stream, then it's over. Otherwise we eat everything. So eventually we'll like parse the actual things in there, but for now we won't bother. If we see a struct, we'll parse a struct. Uh, and what we do to parse a struct uh, is gonna be something like Okay, we need to get the name first. Right, that's the name of our struct. Uh, then we need to parse all the members of the struct. Uh, well, actually, then we need to do uh, a require token on an open brace, right? So we need open brace. And then we need to kind of just sit here and wait till we find a close brace, right? Uh, so we need to sit here and go like, you know, uh, Member token equals get token tokenizer. 
Uh, and then what we do is say like, okay, we look at that member token. If the member token type uh, equals uh, token close brace, uh, then we're done, right? And that's that's basically what we're that's basically what we're after. Uh, otherwise, we'd parse it. Five minute warning. Getting close. Uh, so you know we get the token, the member token. Uh, and then what we do is we do something like parse member uh, and pass it that member token that we got, uh, and that would do whatever it's going to do. Right. So not that complicated. Uh, you can kind of see how this is going, uh, and we'll see if we can get most of it done in the next five minutes. Um, <clears throat> oops, that's supposed to be tokenizer. So we just need require token, parse member, parse member takes the member token. Uh, this is like the type token probably, member type. Uh, so that's really all we need to, to look at. Uh, and inside the parse member, basically we can also do the same thing for this one right now. We can just eat till the semicolon, right? Um, and that should do it. Okay, so let's just quickly write require token. All require token is, uh, again, very, very straightforward, uh, is instead of doing a get token, uh, what require token does is it gets the token from the screen, stream and then sets the results of the, you know, uh, that it's going to return to be whether or not that token type equaled the desired type, right? And it's just, so that's just shorthand. It's just an easy way to say, the only thing I allow here is this. So I just require it, right? So there we go. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. So there we go. Uh, I'm gonna just quick run that. It's not gonna do anything, right? Um, but I just wanna make sure we don't crash or loop or hang or anything like that. So now what we wanna do is we wanna get this outputting something reasonable. Uh, so, okay. So we have our little weird magical printf thing here that prints out, uh, you know, sort of token sizes. So what I want to do here is when we get to our introspection struct, for every member, I just want to print out, right, this. You can see what the code was I was trying to do. I want to print this out. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do something where we can print out, like, this debug value thing or something like that, just for, just for show, right? That's all we're going to do. All I want to do just to make sure that we've got something resembling anything is I'm going to make this parse member thing do that. <clears throat> okay, uh, so here we go. Inside parse member, I, uh, I have my member type token. Uh, and as you can see in here, right, we've got, uh, you know, these are the member types that kind of come down the side here. You can see them. But sometimes they've got a pointer, like this old chunk thing here. It's got a pointer, right? Uh, and then sometimes they've got like array stuff at the end of them too, right? Uh, but for now, we can kind of ignore some of that. So what I could say here is, all right, I got my member type token. Uh, I get this token here. I want to see what type this token is, right? And I'm going to switch to the parsing method here again. So I can switch on whatever the type is. So when I get the token out of this, uh, it could be one of two different things, really. Uh, well, it could be, uh, it, it, oops. Uh, it could be uh, an asterisk, right? Uh, and it could be an identifier. Those are the two things that were there, right? So what I want to do is say, okay, I got my member type token, uh, and right now we're only handling things where this is just a, a regular identifier on the, on the, it's the first thing. Uh, and then I want to say like, okay, uh, is it an asterisk or an identifier that comes next? In fact, probably actually what I would want to do here is say, if the token uh, type equals an asterisk, uh, then this thing is a pointer right? Uh, we don't really care about that yet, but we'll just say like is pointer equals true or something like that. So we know it's a pointer. Uh, and then get the next token, right? Something like that. Uh, so if it's a pointer, it's a pointer. Um, and we could even say that that's sort of going to be a thing. Uh, you know, we could even move that out here. Uh, so we just say like, okay, while parsing token, uh, get token, if the token is an asterisk, we'll say it's a pointer, something like that. Um, and yeah, I guess now that I think about it, the original way is probably better for the shorthand way. We probably want to do this a little bit 
a little bit differently if we were going to have more than a few seconds to implement it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but assuming it's an identifier, now we have all the information that we actually need to print this thing out, right? Uh, and we, I guess we also want to still have these two cases here where if it's the semicolon um, or if it's the end of the stream, uh, we would stop parsing. Right? Oh, man. Okay. Hold on one second. I just want to put this printf in here. There we go. Um, so this would just be like we had here before. I just want to put debug value in here uh, where I print out that name. Uh, and that's going to be, again, this token, assuming it's an asterisk, it's going to be setting its pointer, assuming it's identifier. Uh, then I'm going to assume that it's the name for now. That's not really the way that we want to do it because it's not, it doesn't parse everything that we might want to parse and see, uh, but it's pretty close for now. So there we go. Let's go ahead and compile that. Uh, oops, and that's not supposed to be a break. That's supposed to be a, oops. Oh my goodness. I don't know what that does. Parsing equals false. All right, uh, so let's run this and see what happens. Hey, look. So this, as you can see, is pretty much exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, so if we come back here to handmade.cpp, uh, you can see that we now took something that we were doing manually uh, and we automated it, right? Um, and there's a bunch of things we could do now to this if we wanted to. We probably don't want to output this this way. We've got a lot of cooler stuff we could do with this if we wanted to, uh, but there you go. So that's introspection in an hour. Uh, there's some more stuff, you know, we'd want to flesh this out a little bit more, uh, but yeah, one hour's worth of code. You got an introspector going. Uh, and you can take it pretty far from there if you want to. Uh, staying on schedule here, um, I want to try and keep, because this is the dev stream -a I don't want to be our normal selves where we go nuts and potentially go off schedule or do whatever with Q&A. So I'm keeping on time, 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, and then coming up after me also is uh, going to be um, uh, the Salt and Sanctuary stream. So if you're interested in that game and you're on the dev stream -a that's coming. Uh, so, all right, um, let's go ahead to the Q&A. If you could please, if you want to ask a question, uh, please put Q colon in front of it, uh, and I'd be happy to go over everything. I know, like I said, we kind of wanted to do something weird, so I picked that one because people always ask me about how to do it on the stream. Uh, so now you know, uh, and like you saw, it's real, real easy. Uh, you know, you can make a much better one than what I've done if you spend more than uh, 30, uh, 60 minutes and aren't talking the whole time. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. Q colon. I see no Q colons. Somebody post a Q colon for me to answer. If there is one. If not, we can all just chill out. Paul Smith, it seems like you are doing recursive descent parsing. Is that how you would describe it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I probably should mention that. Um, so basically, there's a number of ways you can write parsers. Uh, and, uh, and you know, since there aren't, I don't see a lot of Q colons here, I'll just, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start with like um, just a, a little bit of, uh, of explanation here. Um, oops. How do I get my little uh, how do I get my little interface back here? Uh, where's the where where did the little where did the little interface go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so here we are, uh, day two hundred six, uh, and I'll just mention briefly. Uh, so for parsing, yeah, what I wrote is definitely considered a recursive uh, descent. Uh, parser. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, actually what I wrote is just a descent parser. We didn't actually use the recursion yet. Uh, now, we would if we had done, you know, if we were doing, spending two hours on it and getting a little more of the type parsing in there, we would have. Um, but what you saw me do is just to get it going a little faster, I used a lot of these while parsing blocks. So technically, the way this works, you wouldn't do it this way. The reason it's called a recursive descent parser, the recursive part, is because normally what you do is you look at what you got. If you got an asterisk, you then call parse member again on whatever comes next, and you build like a tree that way. So I just did it, I did it kind of in a more fast and loose way. 
But like, you know, if Monday we go back, if people want to see me expand it a little, if Monday we go back, you would see a little more of the recursion that you didn't see because I was just kind of shorthanding it. So I made things in loops that really traditionally in a, in a traditional recursive descent parser, um, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't pack enough water for this stream. So my voice is going, <laughs> um, yeah, it can just be a smooth jazz stream from now on. Um, so yeah, so if you take a look at that, ast uh, that like that asterisk thing, that would have been a case where recursion would have happened, the traditional recursion, um, and, and that's how that would have worked, right? And I can even, I could even show you kind of more like what that would look like. You know, you could imagine, um, in fact, you know, you could just imagine doing like this. If you took out the, the wild parsing thing, so, you know, I'll just, I'll give you the, the more <clears throat> sort of complete example. Right, so assuming that we did it the more recursive way, uh, what we would do is something more like this, where we say, okay, just get the token. Whatever the token type is, we'll handle it. If it's an asterisk, I just wanna do parse member again. Right, something like this. Uh, and so that's exactly the same thing, right? Um, but it's a little like, you know, it's a little cleaner. It's a little nicer potentially. Uh, and so if I, you know, if I wasn't, uh, kind of being a little more compressed there, if this was a regular hand where we're like, let's spend this week on metaprogramming, I probably would have thought it through a little more and, and had something a little bit more that way. Right. Um, so yeah, if you take a look at how this works, uh, I don't need to do that. Um, that's there, right. Uh, so that's like a recursive sort of thing where you, where you kind of go down like that. Um, and so now if we, if we run it, you see we get the same output, but you know, I, just, I was just kind of, like I said, I was playing it pretty fast and loose. Uh, so this is a little bit nicer and you know what, that's probably the one I would leave in there as well. So, you know, that's just better. Uh, that's where the recursive part of recursive descent comes in. So just, just wanted to clear that up. Okay, so recursive descent parser, that's where the recursive part is, is this that you assume that instead of like doing while loops to parse things that can have multiple components, you use recursion and the stack to do it. Descent is because we're going down the stack and up, right? So you can see that we start at like the outermost shell and we look at what the tokens are there. And when we get a token, we say, okay, descend one level down the stack and look at it a little bit more carefully, decide what you want to do with it there. Look at it again, go a little more carefully, right? We descend down. So you kind of like, you're winnowing down the options as you go until you finally decide what it is you actually parsed, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's a, a very traditional type of handwritten parser, right? So typically if you're writing a parser by hand, like we just did, you write it this way. Uh, they're very nice because they're very flexible. You can do anything you want with them. Uh, you can put in ad hoc code to do anything you need to do. They're very understandable. It was probably, I'm guessing, pretty easy, even though I went very fast with that, for you to understand what was happening. You didn't just see like a big bunch of gobbledygook where it's like, uh, blah, what's happening? Um, but there are other types of parsers, right? There's like shift reduce parsers and things like this. Uh, and oftentimes these other kinds of parsers, they use like rolling arrays and stacks and things, and they have jump tables that are pre, you know, made and all that stuff. And what they're typically for is they're for generation. So typically what happens is if you write a parser generator, so like Yak or Bison, if you've ever heard of these tools, they will spit out uh, sometimes other types of, of parsers, which are machine, they, they look like sort of machine table driven kinds of things. They're not really so much for writing by hand, um, although you could, uh, they're just not as human natural. It's not what you'd first write, you know. Uh, and so, yes, what we, what we did on this stream was a recursive descent parser. It's a parser that's very traditional in that way, very traditional hand-drawn, top-down recursive descent parser, one token look ahead kind of thing. Um, very, very straightforward. Pseudonym73, can you please satisfy my C standard anal retention by accepting slash V and slash F as white space? Um, <clears throat> because I like pseudonym73 quite a bit, I am more than happy to honor that request for you.
that is no problem. Although to be honest, I don't know, is there anything in particular I have to do? Like, there's nobody, all end of lines on all three platforms are slash n or slash r, right? Is, does C ever let you end a line with anything like that? You have to tell me, I've never used one of those, so. Gary Johansson asks, have you, have you an opinion on OpenCLC? I, I, I've never really used OpenCL, and I definitely don't know what OpenCLC is, but, uh, but yeah. So I'm sorry, I, I, no, I don't have a, I don't know what OpenCLC is. Uh, how would you handle errors if you were deep in the recursion? Is checking return values everywhere the best way? Uh, so error handling, usually what you do, it depends on the circumstance, but usually the reason why error handling is so bad in compilers is because it is a bit tricky. Uh, and so usually what I do is when I encounter an error, I typically do something like I try to put enough logic into the parser for my needs, um, but you can go more nuts with it. And usually what I do is I have an error token too, you know, so you'd have like token error um, that people can like pass up the chain. And I also have a tokenizer on the tokenizer. You call error and put errors into the tokenizer that it like stacks up. That's usually the sort of thing I do. I showed up late. Can you explain what introspection is? Uh, sure. So uh, actually, technically, there's different words. There's introspection and there's reflection and there's different levels uh, at, at which uh, these things happen. But basically what we're talking about is in most programming languages, you typically have, um, <clears throat> well, obviously, a programming language is all about specifying structure of some kind, right? You, ex you are expressing the structure of data, you're expressing the structure of code, you're expressing all of these sort of structures, right? Um, and they could be literal structures, like in C, it's a struct, it's literally just a collection of data. It could be a function, right? A series of, of things to execute with loops and whatever. And the compiler for your language knows what these things are. It has to, because it has to then turn that into working code, right? And so the, the key thing to understand is that structure actually has a semantic form somewhere inside the compiler while it's compiling the code. Now, languages that have a clue, languages that were made by people who know what they're doing, that's not even true. Languages that just, any language should have this, but C++ doesn't because it's just not maintained by people who know what they're doing. So C++ lacks a very crucial feature that most modern languages have. And that feature is the ability to look at those structures from within the code, right? So the structures that the compiler knows about inherently, you can get them during the compilation phase and do things with them that allow you to uh, work with your code in very powerful ways. So for example, here is our entity structure that we were playing around with on Handmade Hero, right? It has these fields in it. I would like to print them out. There is no way in C or C++ to say, tell me all the members of the sim entity structure so that I can print them out. You can do it in other languages. Um, you can do it in JavaScript even, you know, you can, you can do it in all these languages. C++ can't do it. Uh, and that basic capability is called introspection. It's also sometimes called reflection, which is if you have the ability, I think, to like work, to actually do more complicated operations than that. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's a thing that, it's a, it's a more stringent requirement, I think, on, on top of it. But point being, whatever you call it, uh, what we're talking about here on the stream is the ability to do that. C++ doesn't have it, so what I showed on tonight's stream is how to implement it, right? How to put it back in there, because the C++ committee is obviously never going to get around to it. Um, so you need to, right? And so that's what we wrote. This is just a very simple little preprocessor uh, that we can run on our code. And, you know, here is that struct. Right, that's the amenity struct, and you can see um, when I go ahead and run this. Right, um, if, in fact, I'll bring it up on here. Uh, here's my sim region code, and here's uh, we ran our preprocessor, and you can see it, it printed out the members. Right, old chunk storage index, right, that sort of stuff. Uh, and we've got some bugs here, like this guy. Right, you can kind of see even what happened. Um, <clears throat> oh, you know what? I introduced a bug. Uh, actually, you can see that we did it correctly before, but when I did that code just now for the recursive descent. Um, 
spoke a little too soon. So if you look at that code for the recursive descent, uh, there is sort of a, a nasty problem with it, uh, which is if you look at these two guys, this one handled the semicolon end of stream thing, it would properly eat till the semicolon, uh, but a recursive descent thing didn't. So really until we do that, I guess I can't quite switch to that. And I'll put in, I, I didn't mean to undo pseudonym 73's thing here. Yeah, so it would not have worked properly uh, the way that we were doing it before. Oops, that's, I'm in the wrong place. There we go. <clears throat> okay. Um, so yeah, uh, our original one worked, worked better. I knew I must have had a reason for doing that that way, but anyway. Uh, so you can see that we printed them out here. We got old chunk storage index updatable, type, flags, p, dp, distance limit, uh, collision, facing direction, tbob, diabs, tile, hit point, max, hit point, sword, walkable dim, and walkable height, right? And so basically what we did there is add that introspection back in. So now inside our preprocessor, we can do whatever we want with those things, right? And that's, what, that's exactly what we needed uh, and what C++ doesn't give us. Let's see, do you, well, it just says, do you, if John does metaprogramming for his language? Uh, I assume you mean, do you know if John does metaprogramming for his language? Do you mean, does, does it have metaprogramming? The answer is yes, he showed actually uh, for the first time the metaprogramming features um, uh, like Wednesday night. Just, just this past Wednesday, he showed for the first time uh, some of some metaprogramming features he's added. Uh, so I think it probably will be pretty good language for metaprogramming based on how it's going so far. Certainly much better than C++, which doesn't support metaprogramming at all. Insofar as regarding errors again, would this be a place where exceptions would actually be useful? Uh, no, exceptions are never useful. Um, I, I've literally never found a single programming problem where exceptions are better than not exceptions. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. If you like them, you like them. But I, I literally cannot tell you a single time when I've ever thought that exceptions were the right way to program something in my whole life. Um, there was a time when I thought that exceptions were a good idea because that's what I've been told. Uh, but uh, if I look back at all the programming that I've ever done with my current brain, I literally can't think of a single time I would ever say to use them. They are never good. Um, uh, I, I literally don't know of a single time I would use them. Everer, now that we have the preprocessor, do you plan to make more use of it going forward in Handmade Hero? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we'll at least output the debug. We'll output the annotation, right? It'll only take us a day to switch that to an, a full annotator, so we might as well. We've got it, right? Hogan Long, who is John and what language are you talking about? Uh, talking about Jonathan Blow, the designer of Braid and The Witness uh, and the lead programmer on both of those products as well. Uh, he's writing a new programming language called JAI, which is actually pretty far along and it's quite nice. Uh, you can take a look at his YouTube channel, Jonathan Blow. Just search for Jonathan Blow YouTube uh, and you can, you can find out about that. See, Voucher, I'm writing a parser that looks pretty similar to this, but it runs on multi-gigabyte files, which takes a while. Any common approaches to use SIMD multi-threading to speed up text parsing Seems more difficult since the characters aren't independent in the way pixels are. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to speed up parsing, certainly. Um, so uh, I suspect that probably you could do some interesting things there, but honestly, uh, I have never done parsing for bigger than just my code base. And even like just this method of, of doing it is always like, many orders of magnitude faster than the compiler actually compiles it. So I've never had to optimize one of these, ever. They're always the fastest part of the pipeline for me because like Microsoft C compiler is so slow um, that pretty much nothing I ever do uh, becomes a compilation bottleneck. So if you're talking about, like you said, multi-gigabyte files, 
uh, I do appreciate the fact that that would necessitate um, some serious thought there, but I just don't know. Um, I just don't have the experience with it to, to know like what, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is in my head, I can sort of think of things like, okay, how would I start to approach it? Right. But they're, they're just fully speculative. And, and I just, I just don't know. I would have to actually go tackle that program probably myself to have it at really any opinion. Cause it's just, it's just not something I ever had to think about. To Sophos, the stream makes me feel like an extremely inferior and incompetent programmer. Do you approve of this? Uh, not really. Um, I mean, I guess I would just have to ask the question, like, you know, d hopefully, you know, if you look at what I did there, it's not that complicated, right? Like there's not that many moving parts to it. It's very simple. It's just something that takes a look at characters in a stream and make some simple decisions about it, right? And so, you know, if you look at that and go, wow, he like did that really fast or something. Uh, you know, I've been programming for like, for like, uh, oh my God, uh, 32 years. I've been programming for 32 years. I've written, you know, five, six parsers, seven parsers, something like this. Um, <clears throat> so one of the reasons that was so fast is because I just already know basically how it works, right? Uh, and so it's just, it's just very like second nature for me to type that out. And so, you know, I would kind of discount that part of it. So what I would focus on is like, say, can you understand what I did? If you just spend some time, look at it and practice a little bit. And if the answer is yes, then you're as good a programmer as I am. The only difference is you haven't written six of these, right? Um, and a lot of times that's a big part of the difference, right? Um, the reason that somebody looks like a good programmer when they're programming is because they just have a lot of experience. Um, you know, the first couple times I tried to parse stuff, it was a disaster. I didn't even know about tokenizing. I'd never read a book on parsing. And it was like, they're awful. Uh, they were like always scanned for things. And I remember the first time someone like told me, um, <clears throat> you should like do a Lexer. You should have a thing that breaks my tokens. It's like this huge eye opener for me, right? Um, so I feel like, yeah, like don't get discouraged when you see someone who's been programming forever, like who's an ancient, like old crotchety cane, uh, like, and I'm not even making that up. Like I am on crutches right now. Like here are my crutches. I, I crutched over to this to do this dev stream and I will crutch out to the other room when I am done. When you see someone who's been programming so long that they're on crutches at this point and they're old and invalid, um, don't look at that and go like, oh, I can't program that well. It's like, well, duh. But that doesn't mean you won't 30 years from now, right? Um, it's just a question of programming every day and like actually doing the practice. You just get better and eventually you can program quickly. How does metaprogramming change your workflow? Can you talk about incorporating generated code with the regular C files? Uh, yeah, so the way that it typically works is exactly what you just saw. Um, basically what we do is we'll take this and we'll have it start to output some things that are meant to be read as standing C structures. So for example, what I would probably do, right, is instead of outputting this debug value thing, what I would instead output is something like, uh, you know, here is the, the name, you know, the, the field of the thing or whatever as a string, right? Uh, and, and I'd wrap that in something like this, right? And so this is more, what we'd start to do. And now you can sort of see like, okay, this starts to be something we could just insert in a C file, right? And so then maybe we're like, okay, well now, you know, we want to insert this in a C file. We've got this parse struct thing. We get the name token out. All right, so now it just becomes like, let's go ahead and, and print out what the struct is, right? Uh, so we'll say something like, <clears throat> um, care star members of, right? And, um, uh, then we just output that that thing, uh, like members of blah, brackets equals, um, and uh, just gonna go ahead and give you what the idea is here. Right? Um, <clears throat> ooh, excuse me. Uh, right, and so you can start to see how this starts to become like actual C code. 
Uh, and so then you would just do something you'd imagine you have like a member definition or something, right? Uh, and then up here, when we, when we actually output uh, this thing, we would also do like some kind of type field or something like this. Uh, so, you know, uh, member type token would be here as well. So it would be something like, uh, you know, type underscore percent dot star s comma member type token text length member type token text uh, and it's not going to work quite right yet but you can kind of see so this starts to now right be kind of close to something we could just read in code and know exactly what our struct layout looked like right uh, so basically what we do is we just take that, we output that to a C file, and then we compile that C file in with the rest of our C files. Now we have introspection data, the kind that the C++ spec should have been giving us for the past two decades and wasn't, right? So it's just about getting that in there in a way we can use. So, all right, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all the time I've got. I don't think I got any more time for questions. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up because uh, if you're watching the Dev Streamathon, uh, then you are going to want to. Uh, it's going to roll over here in five minutes um, to uh, the uh, Salt and Sanctuary. I believe is the the next uh, the next Dev on the stream. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and save this out and close down <clears throat> and say thank you for joining me to this special edition of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. I hope that satisfied some people's uh, desire to see how metaprogramming, how you sort of start to get that working. Uh, that is the basics of it. Uh, like I said, you saw it can happen in an hour. Uh, and of course, now it's in the Handmade Hero code base. So if you're somebody who wants to play around with it, um, handmadehero.org, you can always pre-order the game and it comes with the full source code. So you can just download the source code and play around with it and see how that works uh, if you are still a little confused about how the metaprogramming stuff works. Uh, and maybe we'll do some more of it on Handmade Hero in future streams as well if people uh, feel like they just want to see like a little bit more of how that uh, sort of thing works. So uh, that's about it. Um, until next time, oh yeah, if you want to catch this stream live again, uh, please do remember also that we have a little tweet bot here. Uh, so if you want to see the schedule, you can see the schedule. Uh, so handmadehero.org, you can just go there uh, and there's a little tweet bot. It'll tweet out the schedule at you uh, and you can see that it's just like, uh, you know, every week it'll, it has a little thing here, which will say like, here's what the stream times are going to be. And then every uh, day it just tweets out a little thing that tells you what the time is that day, uh, if you're wondering. So it's a pretty handy little guy. Uh, that's about it for me. If you're watching the Dev Streamathon, um, it's twitch.tv slash Dev uh, Like I said, uh, it goes, I think for 24 hours, I think it started a few hours ago. So it's going all night and it'll go all day tomorrow as well. Uh, there's a bunch of devs on there doing stuff. Um, <clears throat> so definitely check that out. Uh, if you're someone who just came for the Handmade Hero uh, and hasn't had enough live coding for one evening, you've got more. Uh, so you can go ahead and switch over to that. And uh, I guess I'll just keep talking until 10 p.m. Uh, because I don't know when they'll actually switch over the stream. I hopefully at 10 p.m. exactly. Uh, so there we go. Um, <clears throat> And I guess I'll take this opportunity also to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, as always, all the Handmade Hero guys, it's great to see you here every day. Uh, it makes it a lot less lonely to code knowing that there's so many people who uh, come to visit. And um, uh, yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed that metaprogramming. It was the thing I'd been thinking all week about what I thought we should probably do. And I was like, well, we could do, um, you know, people had mentioned maybe do some lighting stuff and maybe do some animation stuff. And I think those were all good ideas. But what I thought at the end of the day is I was like, well, you know, Handmade Hero is what it is. You know, it's a stream about actual, like very serious programming and it's about the programming. And so I felt like people who were watching for the Dev Streamathon, I didn't want to do something that would give them the wrong idea about the sorts of things that we do here. Like we do very low level stuff. That's, that's what we're about. Uh, we're not about like, you know, making a game, we're about learning to program a game. And those are two very different things, right? Uh, and so I thought that something like that would be a good example. It's a self-contained thing. I knew I could do it pretty quickly. I've written so many metaprogramming things in my life. I knew it was something that, you know, it was, we had a chance to get it done in an hour. As luck would have it, we did. Uh, that was not a foregone conclusion. Um, and certainly we, you know, it was, it was right down to the wire. But uh, as you saw, uh, you know, 
that's kind of the sort of thing that I feel like typifies Handmade Hero is that kind of programming. And so I thought that would be a good example and also something that people who watch Handmade Hero every day would also be entertained by because I know that a lot of people have asked for that in the past and, uh, you know, that they would want to see that. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining me. And um, I, uh, I, hopefully uh, everyone uh, will, will stay tuned for some of those dead streams on things. Uh, let me know how that is. I'll probably go switch over and, and take a little bit of a look at it myself. Uh, so take it easy, everyone, and uh, have fun coding. I'll see you guys back here on Monday.